study by Brother John entitled The Photoshop Christian. It's an interesting world we're living in, a time in which we don't know what is truth and what is not truth. We look at the media, we look at newspapers, we read the magazines, and we have so much conflicting information. One person says one thing, another person says another thing, one church teaches one thing, another church teaches another thing, and what is truth? What is reality? What really is the truth to a so, so today the subject, the Photoshop Christian, sprang from a magazine that came across uh, my desk uh, for the waiting area. And I never look at magazines that come in, you know, for people to read while they're waiting. But this one came in, People Magazine. And I thought, this is interesting. Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda. I remember her. It says 80 years old. And I thought, wow, this exercise guru really looks good for 80 years old. I thought, hmm, maybe I'll open this magazine up a little bit and see what is inside. Well, inside is a whole write-up of Jane Fonda. And she really looks wonderful at 80. I looked at some of the other people there, and they're not anywhere near 80, and she looks just as good as they do. Jane Fonda at 80. Jane Fonda at 80. Jane Fonda to 2010. Some nice techniques and procedures. And a year later, 2011, looks even better than 2010. Jane Fonda at 77. No makeup. No Photoshop. Looks wonderful. But many procedures before and after Jane Fonda. I can't believe how good people can look. And then I thought of something. You know, sometimes, have you ever had that experience? You go on some social media, maybe Facebook or Instagram or something, and you see pictures of people. And then you meet the people, and they don't look anything like the pictures. Something happened. Something makes things look different. This is not going to be a study on Photoshop, but I do want to relate it to Christianity. And how Christians and churches can be Photoshopped to look like and be nothing to what they really are. Look at this picture. Same person, just a little bit of Photoshopping. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Does that sound like a photoshopped church? They, they don't look like anything that they really are. There is a pretense, there is a pretentiousness about this statement that describes certain people and a certain time period that reflects Photoshop religion. And Matthew 23, 26 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within are full of extortions and full of excess. Does that look like something has been changed? Does that look like some photoshopping has taken place? This is what it looks like. Before and after. Things look really good, but in reality, it's not what it appears. Isn't that what this world is all about? You cannot go by appearance. You cannot go by what people say. You cannot go by the news. You cannot even always go by the preachers. You cannot even go sometimes by why you think you understand what you see, what you hear, what you believe. 
Because, you know, the reality, the reality may be totally different. We live in a time of misrepresentation, misconception, and deception to its highest degree. We are living in a very deceptive time. A time where you cannot trust what you see, what you hear, maybe even what you're touching. Jesus is ready to do great things for us when we lay ourselves upon the altar, a living, consuming sacrifice. When we have the Spirit in our hearts, we shall be of one mind in Him. We shall not seek to cover up the defects of characters, but we shall strive earnestly to overcome them. We're living in a cover-up time, a time where character, which is what? The only thing that you can take with you. The only thing we can take with you. We're living in a time where character is covered up. It is no longer what you think you see that it really is. Have you ever had that experience? Not only about looking, but you know, some people, they seem so nice. These things are so wonderful. But then in reality, the character, the character, how defective. How defective. It is photoshopped. That's what it is. Christianity, churches, people are photoshopping things. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But who confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. There is a photoshopping of sin today. A covering of it up, covering it up, making it look real good on the outside. But what did we read? Inside, how is the cup? Filthy, dirty. The latest seen message is to who? People who think they are rich and preach with good, really looking good. But inside is what? What is inside? Something totally different. Very deceptive. This is the age that we're living in. This is the time in which we're living in. Things do not look, in reality, what they appear like. If an individual pass over and cover up their sins, they will not be prospered of God. They cannot advance in the divine world, but will become darker and darker until... The light of heaven will be entirely withdrawn. Is this a serious statement or not? This is serious. If we seek to cover up, if we cover up the filthiness, not recognizing who and what we really are, but making it look pretty on the outside, making it look really pretty, what will happen? We cannot advance and the light from heaven will be entirely withdrawn. That's why to the church of Laodicea, what does he say? Except I repent. I will what? Spew thee out of my mouth. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now it's wonderful to see people looking good. There's nothing, I'm not criticizing the, the nice appearance of various persons and what they have done to enhance themselves. But when we take it, to our Christian experience, it's altogether different. Is it real? Or is it just make-believe? Christ is able to save to the utmost. All who come to Him in faith, He will cleanse them from all defilement if they will let Him. But if they cling to their sins, they cannot possibly be saved. For Christ's righteousness covers no sin unrepented of. The righteousness of Christ is not a Photoshop technique that you can Photoshop and now I am all okay. No, it doesn't work that way. It covers no unrepented sin. God has declared that those who receive Christ as their receiver, accepting Him as the one who takes away all sin, will receive pardon for their transgression. These are the terms of our election. 
Man's salvation depends upon his receiving Christ by faith. This is the only way we can be saved. Not by how we look as Christians, what we have been able to skillfully cover up, Photoshop, but by the reality of our relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, sin is made attractive. That's why we love it. You like sin? Let's be honest. We like certain sins. That's why we do them. Sinning is appealing. Sin is made attractive by the covering of light. What does sin have on it? A covering of light, which Satan throws over it. And he is well pleased when he can hold the Christian world in their daily habits and so on. See, sin is not made to look ugly. Sin is photoshopped. It is given a covering of light. And you know the devil, by the way, he is also uh, an angel of light. He doesn't come with a pitchfork, uh, horns, and a tail. What do we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14? Be not deceived. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. You see, we said, if something looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. But Satan cannot be identified. So simple. He photoshops himself. You see, this may look like a duck, have the feet of a duck, but it is the body of a little chick and the head of a rabbit. You cannot believe and identify things that you see. For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they could deceive the very elect. Is this a statement of caution to each and every one of us? See, if it were possible, thank God for that word, if. Because in the relationship with Christ, it is not possible. But if we do not have a relationship with Christ, if we are self-reliant, if we want to rely on what we see, what we touch, the senses, what we hear, what we think, we can be and will be deceived. Sin is covered with light. And the devil is also an angel of light. You see, this, this is what happens. This is how the devil comes. He doesn't come as a wolf. He comes as a lamb. He comes as a lamb. And he presents things. You see, the strategy of the Garden of Eden is still effective today. He came and presented himself to mankind almost miraculously, right? Through a serpent that was talking. The same thing is happening in the world today. You see, the greatest deception that men suffer is from their own opinions. You know, a lot of times we think that the deception comes from without, yes, but then it comes and becomes part from within, and our greatest deception is what we believe, what I think is right, because I've seen it, and I've tasted it, and I know that's just what it is. That is a duck. No, it's not a duck. It's a rabbit. No, so I have my opinion. Well, that opinion may be deceptive. It may not be the right opinion at all. It may be a wrong opinion. So what is the defense of God's people at this time? What is it? It is a living connection with heaven. Friends, we cannot rely upon ourselves. What we know, what we think, what we understand, what we've been told, we can only rely on a what? Living connection with heaven. If we would dwell in safety from the noise and pestilence, if we would be preserved from the danger seen and unseen, we must hide in God. We must secure the protection and care of Jesus and holy angels 
In these days of peril, the Lord would have us walk before him in humility instead of trying to cover our sins. We would have us confess that as Joshua confessed his sins in the time of the ancient Israel. Let us give up that photoshopped religion. Let us give up that covering of sin. Let us confess our sin. Let us recognize our condition. Let us admit we are miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And yes, the ugliness of sin is within each and every one of us. Let us confess it. The people who God is leading will be peculiar. Now that's an interesting word. The people who God is leading will be peculiar. Are they going to look like that? They will not be like the world. If they follow the leading of God, they will accomplish His purpose. If they follow the leading of God, they will accomplish His purpose and will yield their will to His will. Christ will dwell in their hearts. The people whom God is leading will be what? Peculiar. Now what does that mean? There are many interpretations for that. I'd like to submit to you that doesn't mean this. You know, there is a day for peculiar people. It's Peculiar People Day. It's January 10th. You know, in America, we have holidays and days for everything and everybody. So we have a Peculiar People Day. So is this going to be our day because God wants us to be peculiar? So on January 10th, that's going to be our day. No, it's not. No, it's not. Peculiar. They're going to be his prized possession. They're going to be his treasure. The discipline and the training that God appointed for Israel was designed to cause them in all their ways of life to differ from the people of other nations. This peculiarity, which they should have been regarded as special privilege and blessing, was to them unwelcome. You see, who wants to be different? No, we don't want to be different. We want to be photoshopped really nice so we on Facebook we all look good on that Christian Facebook. You know, in that church that everything on the outside looks really wonderful. Different. Nobody wants to be different. And yet God, through His discipline and His training, wants to make us different. But this is unwelcome. Unwelcome. The simplicity and self-restraint essential to their highest development, they long to exchange for the pomp and self-indulgence of the heathen people. To be like all other nations. See, there's a tendency we want to be like all other Christians. We want to be like all other churches. We want to be like everybody. We want to look good. This is what Israel said in 1 Samuel. Now make us a king to judge us like all other nations. Do you think modern Israel is any different today? They wanted to have that system of organization, that system of government, like all the others. Like everybody else, they did not want to be, what's that D word? Different. Or the P word? Peculiar. That training, that discipline that God was trying to give them was unwelcome. They didn't like it. Are we like that today? We want to be like all the other churches. We want to be like all the other Christians. And so if we can't be like that, we'll Photoshop ourselves into that look. We'll make that appearance like all other nations. The Israelites did not realize that to be, in this respect, unlike other nations, was a special privilege and a blessing. God had separated Israel from every other nation to make them his peculiar treasures. But they, disregarding this high honor <coughs> eagerly desired to imitate the example of the heathen. What blindness, what in 
gratitude. Now that's a different way of looking at being a peculiar people. We should be grateful. We should be thankful that God wants to make us his special prized possession. May this be a welcome change, not something that we disregard and dislike. But they wanted to eagerly imitate the example of the Hebrews. Many have urged that by uniting with secular people and conforming to their customs, they can exert a stronger influence over the ungodly. Have you ever heard that, that concept? You know, the, the concept in the world, not of the world, that's an interesting concept, and we need to understand what that means, and how does that look, and how is that understood, and how is that practically lived? Many think that uniting with secular people and conforming to the government, they can exert a stronger influence over them. But all who take this path separate themselves from the source of their strength. Becoming friends of the world, they are enemies of God. Let's pause here for a moment. And let's reflect into this message to ourselves personally. Am I a friend of the world? Is the world my friend? Am I a friend of the world? If I am friends of the world, I am what? Enemies of God. You see, there's only one friendship relationship. A relationship with an intimate, living connection with God where we're friends with God. And if we are friends with God, then what are we with the world? Enemies. See? If we're friends of God, then we're enemies of the world. If we're friends with the world, then we are what? Enemies with God. You see, it's, 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 it's not a relationship where you can have many friends. Yes, we can have many friends, but not in this kind of relationship. This is a monogamous, single relationship. And that's why the term adultery and adulterous people is used in Scripture so much in the Old Testament. God does not have or accept friends that are having friends multiple friendships with Satan in the world. He can have only one friendship with his people. To be a Christian is to be christ -like. A man of faith. A man of principle. The Christians most serviceable in the church are those whose convictions are so firm, whose character is so strong, that nothing can sway them from their faith or deter them from their duty. Are you that kind of a person? Are you a person that is so strong that nothing can sway you from your faith? As a people, who's that talking to? Who's that talking to? And this was in 1883, just one year before 1844. And look what she was saying right there. On October of 1833, as a people, what would you say today? We are all together too much like the world. She said that in 1883. And what was the Advent movement like at that time? We are not the separate holy people that God requires us to be. When we come up to the high standard of God's law, then shall we be indeed the light of the world. Interesting. Coming up to the standard of what? God's law. In other words, it's not going to be the talk so much as a reflection in the life. It's not going to be the Photoshop Christian look looking real pretty on the outside. But inside full of dead man's bones. When we come up to the standard of God's law, then, see this is an interesting concept, when, then. We should read that and understand what that means. What does that teach? When we come up to 
God's standard, then shall we be the light of the world. What is God waiting for? When will he come? When he will see what? Is that going to be the Photoshop look, the Christian look outside? I'm going to really look like a good Christian. I'm going to, I'm going to come to church on Sabbath and, and, and study my lesson and, and, and all of these things. I'm, I'm going to look really nice. It's not talking about that at all. It's talking about when something happens where? On the inside. And when only can that happen? And how only can that happen? Is that something I can do? I'll tell you what we can do. I'll tell you what I can do. I can Photoshop. I can do the outside. But I can't change the inside. I can't change the reality of who and what and what I really am. Only God can do that. Only a connection with heaven can do that. Only the work of the Holy Spirit. And now we talk about compromise. No compromise. God does not compromise reality with an outside appearance. There is no compromising there. No compromising. We are not to cringe and beg pardon of the world for telling them the truth. We need to be real. We should scorn concealment. Scorn concealment. I'm afraid there is too much photoshopping going on in churches. It's called concealment. Unfurl your colors to meet the cause of men and of angels. Let it be understood that Seventh-day Adventists can make no compromise. We need to unfurl who we really are. In our, in your opinions and faith, there must not be the least appearance of wavering. The world has a right to know what to expect of us. We don't need to waver. We don't need to cover things up. We need to be what we are. See, spiritual death happens one compromise at a time. It's one thing on this point, and there's another point, another point, and we're compromising all these things. Why? Why? Because we want to look good. We want to be like all the other churches. We want to be like all the, all the other Christians. We want to have that good Photoshop Christian look. The Jews were led into error and room, and to the rejection of the Lord of glory because they knew not the scriptures. A great work is before us to lead men to take God's word as a rule of their lives, to make no compromise with the traditions and the customs, but to walk in all of the commandments and ordinances of God. There needs to be no compromise based on traditions or customs. This is a powerful statement. And in the context of this light, I wish you to give us a new understanding. A new understanding. The Apostle Paul declared that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then that persecution seems to slumber in such a great degree? What is that? The only reason, the only reason is that the church has conform to the world's standard. Compromise. It has been photoshopped. I mean, and therefore, awakens no opposition. It looks good. The religion which is current in our days is not the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, that photoshopping, because the great truths of God's word are so indifferently regarded. So indifferently regarded. Because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of faith and power 
of the early church. And the spirit of persecution will be revived. And the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Why am I not persecuted today? It's a question I need to ask myself. Why is this church not being persecuted? Why are we not seeing persecution? Compromising, covering up, conformity, not a revival of the faith, all the points we've been touching on, brethren, sisters. We must, we must put away that app. That app is nice on the computer. I think it has its place, and you can do wonderful things with it. I do not want to criticize anything about Photoshop. It's a wonderful application, but it has no application for Christianity, for the spiritual life. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. We cannot use that to make ourselves better. We cannot use that to get ourselves anywhere. We cannot use that to really cover up the ugliness of from what is within. We cannot. See, what if Daniel, what if Daniel, I don't want to be reading anything. What if Daniel would have said, you know what, let's just compromise on this food thing. You know, it, it's, it's not that big a deal. We can get by with it, you know. Or let's say, let, you know, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they had that image there, and, and it was said, like, you've got to bow down. Well, you know what, let's Photoshop this scene a little bit. We're going to bow down, but in our hearts we're going to stand up. See? An outward appearance of compliance and compromise, but an inward holding firm to the truth. How would that have gone? Would that have been acceptable to God? See, and that is the Christian cover for today. One wrong step. How many? One wrong step would have probably have led the others to others until their connection with heaven would have been severed. They would have been swept away by temptation. This is a, another powerful statement. Where the people of the world will try to induce us to soften our message. See, we're living in a time of political correctness and theological correctness and all this form of correctness. So we have to Photoshop how we talk and what we say and how we look like. And you know what the Sabbath thing? Don't make it so. That's, this was in regards to the Sabbath, to the Sentinel, a paper that was published in the time of Ellen White. And, and they were saying, well, just, just, just don't put that thing in there so plainly and we will support that. You could read it in its entirety. And she says, I am forbidden to warn you that deceptive sentiments are entertained in terms of a false modesty. Brethren, shall we permit the world to shape the message that God has given us to bear to them? We do not need to Photoshop our truth. I was shown our danger as a people of becoming assimilated into the world rather than into the image of Christ. There's a danger. I felt alarmed as I saw that the spirit of the world was controlling the hearts and the minds of many who make a high confession of the truth. Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly for Christ's sake shall suffer persecution. Why then is it that we are conformed to the world? You know, friends, I'm, I'm reminded of a story that I read just this week. The story is of Ivan the Great, the Russian conqueror, who was a powerful military strategist, who did tremendous things for Russia in the 15th century. He was so busy with all of his military strategies and all of his successes because he was freeing Russian from the Tartars and he was pushing them out and he was again establishing Russia. He had no time to get married and have children and have a family. And so the 
his advisor said to him, you know, Ivan, you need to find a wife, get married, so that you can have heirs and that your legacy can live on. And so he agreed. And his advisors went out to look for a wife for him. The story's uncommon. And so they went and looked in the then known world and they found a very nice young woman. She was the daughter of the king of Greece. And he agreed to follow through with what his advisors say and marry her. To have children and have heirs and so the great Russian Tsar could live on through his children. But now there was a requirement. The requirement in order for him to marry this young woman was he had to become Greek Orthodox. He had to become a Greek Orthodox. Otherwise, he would not be married in Athens. So he agreed. He agreed he will become a Greek Orthodox. So a priest was sent up to Russia to help indoctrinate him and to teach them about the beliefs of the Greek Orthodox Church. And when he was ready, and he had learned the faith and was ready to become a Greek Orthodox, he was then welcome to come to Athens to be baptized. And so he went with 500 of his most skilled soldiers. The ones that were immediately around him, 500 of them and himself, went down to Athens to be baptized. They believed in immersion, baptism by immersion. And so when the 500 finest skilled warriors were there with him, they realized that their leader was going to be baptized. They wanted to be baptized too. But they didn't have the training. They didn't have all that training that he had. So, the, yeah, the, the Greek Orthodox Church agreed to baptize them all. That was a 500 plus one baptism service in the Mediterranean Sea by immersion. Except another problem came up. The Greek Orthodox Church did not agree to the baptism of professional warriors. You cannot be a warrior, a soldier by profession, and be baptized into the church. So they had to make another compromise. They had to compromise. Well, how can we have this baptism, but still not baptize the warrior? You know that professional warrior, so it was agreed upon. And I could just see it in my mind's eye. All those soldiers dressed as only soldiers can be dressed. And all those priests, 500 of them, only as priests can be dressed. Black. The others may be more colorful. They all went into the Mediterranean Sea to be baptized together. And so it was agreed that during the baptism service, by immersion... The soldier would take his sword and raise his right arm so that it would not come under the water. It would not be baptized. So the unbaptized right arm would meet the requirements of the church, but they could still be baptized. So by not being professional warriors, holding up the sword above the water, they were all baptized into the Greek Orthodox Church. Oh, friends, sometimes in our religion, do we think, do things the same way? We hold up something. We hold up something that we don't want to go under the water because we do not want to give it up. We want to still live this way. We want to still compromise. We want to still compromise. But yet we want to still be part of the church. We want to do things our way. May the Lord help us to realize that compromising is sometimes a snowball effect. We compromise on one thing. We hold up that right arm. We don't give it. But in reality, there are so many other things we're holding out. So if that is speaking to you or to me today, may we be willing to give up everything for Christ. May we be willing to have that true faith, that living faith, not that photoshopped religion, but the real religion that comes from within is my wish and prayer. Amen. Amen.